10 seconds. Hi everyone, welcome to lecture three of CS287. But we still have a little bit of material to cover from lecture two. So we're first gonna go through a few slides from lecture two that we didn't cover yet. And then we'll start the lecture three slides. Um, in terms of logistics, um, everybody who contacted us about getting into the class, if you did not hear back from us, that, that means we lost your email, so contact us again. But if we got your email, we replied to you on Tuesday night, and you should have gotten a response that finalizes whether you're in or out. Um, other logistics, homework one is supposed to go out today. Might be pushed back to tomorrow, depending on how ready it is today. We'll see. We want to only get it to you when it's actually ready. And you'll have a little less than two weeks to complete that. I recommend you start early, because it'll be representative of the future homeworks. And so if homework one doesn't go well, you might still have time to kind of drop out of the class and take another class. And if it goes well, then you know you're all set, and the other homework should go similarly well. Any questions about logistics? OK, so one thing I did is I, I wrote on the board the main equations we're going to see again in the first half of lecture. Just as a reminder, it'll always be up here for this lecture, the value iteration equation and the max nth uh, solution. And so that way you can, can keep looking at it and internalize it if you're not that familiar with it yet. All right, quick recap of where we're at. We looked at the notion of an agent acting in an environment supposed to maximize the reward it collects in that environment. Um, the way we formalize this is through a mark of decision process, which has a set of states, a set of actions, a transition model that describes the probability of landing a status prime when you start in state S and took action A, a reward function which describes what we care about, high reward is good, low reward is bad, and a discount factor which determines how much we care about future rewards because what we optimize is discounted sum of rewards and so gamma to the t, since gamma is between 0 and 1, if gamma is closer to 0 then far out you don't really care, if gamma is closer to 1 you keep caring about things further out. Then the main algorithm we covered to solve an MDP is value iteration. And the key thing here is this update equation, V i star, V star i plus one, which is the optimal expected discounted sum of rewards you can collect when starting from state S and getting i plus one time steps to act in the environment, can be computed recursively as a function of V i star, which is the optimal value for only i steps to go. And so we see here is the max overall actions, then average over next states, because we don't control that. The environment determines where we end up, and we average over that. The immediate reward we get, plus discount factor gamma times expected discount rewards we'll get with only i steps left. And the way we initialize it, we can just set v0 star for all states s equal to 0, because when there's 0 time steps left, there's 0 reward left to be collected. And that's also the equation I have up here, so you can reference it throughout lecture. We saw value iteration in action on this grid world, and we kind of saw that you know, on the, if there's only one step left, well, only the two states from which you get to exit, you get anything non-zero for value, everything else is still zero, and then it kind of radiates out from there as you get more and more steps to act in the world. And then at some point, it actually converges. This is after 100 iterations, these are the values, these are the optimal values for 100 time steps left in the world, and actually with 1,000 time steps left in the world, up to two digits precision, exactly the same amount as it was before. Then we saw an alternative way of solving MDPs. You might wonder why would you see more than one way? Well, um, right now, um, value iteration might seem the most natural one. Uh, between the two, but in the future we might see algorithms that actually build upon policy iteration uh, when we solve large problems where we need approximations. So, in policy iteration, one iteration of policy iteration says I already have a policy, and you start with just some policy. You can choose whatever it is, you pick some policy, prescribe an action for each state. You then evaluate that policy using policy evaluation, um, which is like value iteration just without the max, because the action is prescribed. You don't get to choose it anymore. 
You can run this till convergence. Once you've done that, you have the value for that policy for each state, and then you can do one step look ahead against that value to say, well, if I were to use policy pi k, which is the kth policy in my iteration count, um, from the next time step onwards, but I get to choose my first action still freely, what action would I choose? And that's a way to improve upon the policy pi k and gives us policy pi k plus one. And then we go back to policy evaluation of policy pi k plus one, do in principle infinitely many iterations of policy evaluation until we have the values, and then we go to the policy update again. And this uh, will also converge, and in some conditions it will converge faster. Then we looked at this grid world here where there are some obstacles, and there was also some question about this on Piazza, which was answered actually really well by uh, a couple of students. Um, but just to quickly recap, um, in this world, what we're looking at is a grid world. And when we solve an MDP, by default, um, we get a solution for that specific MDP. But in the real world, it's possible that the MDP you're solving is actually not a perfect model of the world. And so in this scenario here, maybe a new obstacle gets put in place, but you don't know about it. And you're just executing your policy. And if somebody chooses that adversarially, it'll probably block you from getting to the goal, and you won't succeed anymore with your current policy. That's when we said, well, can we maybe find a way to be more robust? If maybe we find, instead of a policy that's deterministic, a stochastic policy, so it essentially has a range of things that could happen. And so if it gets blocked somewhere, well, there's other things that it might do the next time step, because it doesn't get stuck in this deadlock doing the same thing over and over, bumping into that same wall. The concept we had there was the concept of um, maximum entropy. Um, Entropy is this notion that you can measure for a random variable with distribution p how uncertain you are about that random variable. It's a measure that's specifically kind of motivated from information theory. It also is very convenient because it's a measure where when you do the math, it always, almost always kind of works out really nicely. As we saw in the derivation for max n for one time step, we saw the math worked out nicely. So it kind of has two good reasons to use it. One, the math will work out nicely. Two, it's very well motivated information theoretically. So entropy measures how much uncertainty about the random variable. A canonical entropy plot is this one. Um, variable can be either 1 or cannot be 1, let's say 0. Horizontal axis here is probability of being 1. If it's 100% probability of being 1, it's here. Entropy is 0, no uncertainty. 100% probability of being 0, entropy is 0. In between, entropy is higher. And the more spread there is, the higher uh, the entropy. So on the left, you'll have higher entropy than on the right here. And you can also compute this. Then we said, OK, let's reformulate MDPs with max ent. Um, this is the original formulation. Let's now do max ent. We add an extra term. We want the policy to have high entropy in every state. And there's a trade-off factor there, beta, um, which the higher uh, beta is, the more you care about having high entropy. And the lower beta is the less you care about entropy and more you care just about collecting rewards. Then we had a little sidestep we had to do into constraint optimization, namely that if we want to solve a constraint optimization problem, we can instead actually solve this min-max problem, where the objective is now called the Lagrangian, and it's this thing over here. And we saw that at solution, the derivative with respect to x will be 0, the derivative with respect to lambda will be 0. And then we solved the max n problem for one time step. So we worked through this, um, did a bunch of math using that constraint optimization uh, math from the previous slide, did some simplifications, and found that the optimal policy, pi, for a one step MDP, so it doesn't depend on state, you're just always in the same situation initially, pi of a is this thing over here, which key here is that we exponentiate the reward. And then there's a normalizing factor here, z, to make it all sum to 1, because it's a probability distribution. And so the higher the reward, the more likely. And in fact, um, exponentiating makes things go up very quickly. So if one action has much higher reward than the others, it'll have much higher probability than the others. Then you can actually fill this back into the objective. Our objective was this thing over here. And so we can see, well, what is the value we actually achieve on this objective when we fill in this um, formula for the policy, 
And then this is just a bunch of simplification, simplification math. No, no conceptual steps there. Just kind of grunge through the math. What comes out is this thing over here. It's, let's ignore the beta. Let's assume beta equals 1. Then we have log sum exp ra. So we're exponentiating everything. And then we're taking the log. Um, roughly what that comes down to is if you're the biggest number, um, after exponentiating and looking at that sum, the biggest number will dominate. And so it'll be pretty much exp of the biggest number. You take the log of that, you get back out the biggest number. It's not exactly that. It's a soft version of that. Every ra contributes, but so it's a soft version of that. The more the coefficient in front of ra um, makes everything go to 0, so you divide by a big number, the less the biggest one can be bigger than the others, and the more they'll all contribute, then you get a softer, something close to an actual average of the numbers. And the more beta allows the largest one to be bigger, that is, the more beta is close to zero, which will scale everything up, the more the largest one will stand out, and the more it'll just be a hard max. All right, so that's a quick recap of what we covered last lecture. Now what we need to do is we need to see if we can derive max end for value iteration. So let's do that one on the board. So our max end for value iteration, what does it mean? We now have as objective max over pi policies. And now this will be stochastic policies. We know that because the solution to the max end problem is not going to be deterministic. So policy pi will not just be from state to a action. It will be from state to distribution over actions. Expected value because we don't, we will now have not just stochasticity in the environment maybe, but also stochasticity in our policy. So definitely an expectation here. Sum over time. 0 through infinity, reward at time t, plus beta entropy of the policy in the state we're in at time t. I'm ignoring discounting here. If you want to add discounting, you can add it in. But just kind of, you, you know where the discounting would go. It would go here, gamma to the t. But just to keep the symbols a little lower, um, we are doing no discounting on this one. Then we define vk of s as max over policies of the expected value of sum from t equal h minus k through h r s t a t plus beta h pi a t given s t well really pi there's no a t here um, okay so what we have here is we're defining the optimal value for the max n problem with k steps to go as well, the reward we get in the last k steps and also the entropy we collect in the last k steps. Yes? Hey, does h mean entropy in both cases, or does it mean horizon? Oh, yeah, we have two h's here. So how about I make one of them something else? How about I make this one the horizon? I'll make t, because entropy is kind of always h. And horizon is sometimes capital T, sometimes H. So yeah, there we go. Thank you. Now we can do a similar recursion as we had over there. Let's see if we can compute VK from VK minus 1. VK of S equals max over pi expected value of the reward we'll get immediately from being in state S and taking action A, plus beta times the entropy we get in state S. 
And well, sometimes I put a dot here, sometimes I'll, I'll just put A. It kind of means the same thing essentially, but just keep in mind if the A here, it's still a distribution over which we compute entropy. Plus V K minus one of S prime, which would be the next state we visit. Now I'm gonna make a small definition. And the definition I'm gonna make is I'm gonna say this here plus this here, I'm gonna call Q. So I'm going to say, I'm going to rewrite this as Q K S A plus beta H pi A given S. And everything else stays the same. So max over pi, expected value, there we go. Now, when we look at this problem here, this is actually the same problem we solved over here. There is no difference. The only difference is that over here, we have an appearance of R instead of Q. But that's the only difference. Nothing else is different in those equations. So that means if we know the solution to this optimization problem, we know the solution to that one. We just take the solution of this optimization problem, and wherever there's an R in the solution, we put in a Q, and we're good to go. Does that make sense? So we don't need to redo all this math. We don't need to resolve this. We know we already solved this problem. And what's the solution? Well, the solution is pi K A given S equals 1 over Z exp 1 over beta, Q instead of R. There it was R, but again, R became Q. Um, Q, K, S, comma, A. That's our stochastic policy. So we favor taking actions where we have high Q value. What is Q value intuitively? A Q value in state S and action A means that you are in state S, you're 100% committed to action A, how much reward do you expect to get from then onwards? You're committed to A, you haven't taken it yet. You're in state S, you're committed to action A, you're about to take it, how much reward do you expect to get? Well, you expect to get that RSA, and then you expect to get um, future Vs. Um, but once you're committed to A, of course, there's no entropy anymore. Um, so that's not really there. So the, the Q, once you're committed to A at the current time, doesn't have the entropy anymore, it just has this and this. The Q still includes entropy from the future, because once you've taken your action, you're in the next state, you'll have a distribution over actions again. That comes in through this, of course, because this V has entropy in it from the future that you get rewarded for. So this is our action distribution, and our value will be same equation over here. Again, the only difference between this objective and the one over there is that there's an R here instead of, and a Q over there. So we have value is this kind of log sum X thing where we essentially look at the max if we have a very kind of beta very close to zero and we look as a, just an average really when beta gets close to infinity. So V, oh, they're starting to run out. Um, V K S equals beta log sum over actions exp 1 over beta Q K S comma A. Any questions about this? Yes? Sorry if this is a naive question. Could you give a little bit of intuition around uh, where, what the exponent is for? Like, like that's just applying stop max over all of the like, values that we're taking to get a score? Or where does that You're talking about the exponent here? Yeah. So what is it doing? It's doing the same thing it was doing over there. It's saying, I mean, 
first of all, it falls out of the math. Like I'm not putting it there because I, I necessarily want it there. It just falls out of the derivation. We did the derivation last lecture and we just copied the result over. Well, intuitively what's happening is when you exponentiate something, big things become really big, medium things become like a little bit big, and small things become really small, especially if they were negative, they become really small. And so the effect you have here is that it kind of amplifies the difference between all these numbers, between all the Q, K, S, A, amplifies that difference. Um, and so what that means is that when you then look at what happens here, if something is the biggest Q value, it'll get amplified and it'll get very high probability. Whereas something that's medium will get somewhat small probability, something that's tiny will get essentially zero probability in this calculation here. And then here the same thing is happening, but it's happening in terms of by taking the log at the end here, you actually pull back out the original values. So the log here counters the exp. If there's only one action, it would directly counter it. There would be no summation in between. Because there's a summation in between, you can't, can't swap that. So it's not like the exp and log just cancel out. But effectively what happens is the big ones will dominate the summation. The small ones will be kind of disappearing in that summation because exponentiation grows very quickly with bigger numbers. And so ultimately you'll be left with roughly the biggest one take the log of that and you'll get a max. It's not entirely true, the others contribute a little bit, so you get actually a little more than just the max of the biggest one, a slightly higher number than just the max of the biggest one. So you're effectively like using the transformation to change the probability distribution, but then getting back the same value that was originally indexed. Um, these values here, QKSA, are coming from this identity over here, correct, and that has that's reward and future value. So the, this is really values that are living in here. Reward plus value lives in here and is together value for an extra time step. Yes? Why do we look at the, uh, this formulation uh, considering how reward is deterministic? It's only R of SA rather than R of SA comma X times A. Um, so uh, the question, I think, is why is there an expectation here with this inside the expectation? Um, the reason th this is inside the expectation is because the policy can be stochastic. So there's still an expectation happening over actions. Even, even if the, like, why is it no longer R of S comma A comma S prime? Oh, just, I mean, it's just a lot to write and you can do, I mean, you can do as a homework exercise to just practice to put an S prime in there and you'll, you'll get somewhat similar results. It's just probably a little more hairy when you derive it, but ultimately the same intuition will go through. Yes? But just, so just to be clear, R of, it's going to be R of S A, S prime, plus B K of S prime, summed over all S primes, essentially. Where, here? Like, uh, like R of this expectation, the, if you want to be explicit, this expectation is over, um, over, a, right? over A and over S prime? T plus 1 or S prime, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, let's call it S prime. It's over both of those. Yes? Uh, where exactly are you using the um, derivation from last time? Like the so we look at this thing over here. This maximization problem, we try to maximize expected value plus entropy. If you look at this, that's exactly the same as what we have over here. It's written slightly differently here, but it's expected value plus entropy. Exact same thing. Just over here, expected value has a Q, and over there has R, but uh, otherwise it's the exact same thing. So we can just take the solution from this problem and swap in Q for R, and we're good to go. Now let's look at some of these in action. So we're going to watch some videos here where we have on the left, we're going to see the values evolve over time as we have iterations. So, um, and on the right, we will see rollouts. So the red dots or red little squares are where the agent starts and you'll see the policy in action from there. And then on the left, you'll see value function uh, plots. Um, 
When I said at the top, T equal one, beta equal one, essentially what I'm saying is, when we call some, some people call it beta, some people call it T for temperature, um, but we already have a lot of T's in kind of what we're doing with MDPs, but I just want you to be aware that some people will call it temperature, which is another capital T that, that would appear. Um, so let's see what happens. Beta equal one, um, which I guess we don't really know what that means at this point. I mean, we don't know if that's high or low because we need to kind of compare like what happens when it's one and then later we can see what happens when we make it lower or higher, do we get a different behavior? So let's take a look at this in action. Initially, with very few iterations, it can look far ahead. So for most states, it can never read, the reward is given at the bottom right here. It'll never reach there. So the optimal thing is to be just uniform action distribution for those states. If you never can get to the goal, what's the point in doing anything that uniform action distribution? And in fact, we see that with beta equal one, which puts a pretty high weight on the entropy, most of it throughout stays just maximize essentially entropy and pretty much ignores reward because it's so hard to get. There's some discounting also, so it's kind of far away and it doesn't really affect much what you're doing anywhere else. There's much more to be achieved in terms of objective by just maximizing entropy and that's what's happening. Then um, let's make beta a little smaller. Sorry, t should be 1e minus 2 and just t and beta are the same. Oh, I realize now what it is. Well, the way I wrote it is t is 1 over beta is 1e e minus 2. Um, let's see what happens now. So we care less about entropy now. Um, the values will propagate a bit more out from the bottom right. Um, if the agent starts somewhat close, it'll in a jittery way try to get to the reward state at the bottom. But if it starts far away, it still has very little incentive to actually make it closer. And then here we have 1e e minus 3, and things will propagate even further out in terms of value propagation. Um, but still, even at a, of a beta value of 1e e minus 3, mostly it likes to jitter around. And so you see that you, know, you actually need to bring your um, beta pretty low for this to um, do anything that resembles optimal behavior, which is what we get here if we run it for beta equals 0. We don't care about entropy at all. We see the fronts coming out from here. Um, it's getting a slightly less red color further out because it's discounted. So from further away, it takes longer to get to the reward. You get a little less. Um, on the top here, it still doesn't care at all about where it goes. Um, but soon when the front reaches there, it'll start caring and it'll start also moving towards the bottom right. And at the end, they all kind of make their way into that bottom right spot because it propagated all the way. All right, so what we covered in today's last Tuesday's lecture so far um, is everything but linear programming. So let's take a look at this last way of solving MDPs. This is a way of solving MDPs that actually has been very popular, um, I would say, was very popular maybe 10 years ago. It was the only way people were able to get really nice guarantees when solving things approximately. These days it's a little less popular, but I still want to make sure you're aware of the ideas behind it. Because with all those things, I mean, in 188, 20 years ago, nobody was working with neural nets pretty much. And we still taught neural nets. And then all of a sudden it came back, so it's good we kept teaching it. And maybe the same thing will happen here. Maybe even though now almost nobody's doing linear programming for solving MDPs, maybe a couple years from now somebody has a new breakthrough, builds on it, and then at least you, you know, or you might be the one building on it um, in the near future, making it popular again. So I'm not going to work this one out on the board because I don't want to spend as much time on it as the other ones. But here's a linear program that we can solve to do, essentially, to solve for v star. Let's start with the original thing. So we want a solution to this equation. And the way we found it is either to value iteration or policy iteration. And we found that it converges to v star, which satisfies this equation. Can we actually solve this equation directly? You say, well, this is just a nonlinear equation. Can we just say nonlinear equation solver? I have you know, as many variables as there are states. I have as many equations as there are states. So as many equations as variables. It's nonlinear because of the max. But just give me a solution, see what comes out. That hasn't been too successful. What we can do is formulate it as a linear program that will do something somewhat similar. So here's the idea. We're going to minimize v. 
which is or over V, this quantity over here. And these weights are supposed to be positive. So there's a positive weighting. You can say all may be equal to 1 or something um, of the values in the state, such that for all states and actions, the value is bigger than or equal to this thing. So think about this. Here we wanted equality. And then here, we're saying, actually, we're going to make it an inequality. We're going to get rid of the max. We're just going to say, if it has to be bigger than the max, it just has to be bigger than all of them. So I can just expand the number of equations, say, I need to be bigger than all right-hand sides, no matter what the action is. And then I don't want to be too much bigger. I want to kind of lean into this and have it satisfied with equality for the action that achieves the max. For the other ones, we can't, because we have to be bigger than the one that achieves the max. And that's exactly how this is set up over here. So we minimize the v values while making sure that they're bigger than the thing on the right-hand side, which in turn, um, oh, this should be a regular v, or they should all be v stars. Um, so that's the intuition. Um, now, theorem says that v star is the solution to the above linear program. Now, the way I explained it, it might sound very intuitive, but like, okay, this all makes sense. It's very natural. You know, you have this equation. You need to be equal to the max. That means bigger than all of them. I make it bigger than all of them, and I make it lean as, in as closely as possible. It's going to be equal to the max. But it's actually a catch. V also appears on this side. So the intuition I kind of portrayed to you isn't exactly uh, tight from a mathematical point of view, because as you're trying to minimize here to lean against this, you're also bringing this thing down, and it's more complex than I just said. Yes, question? Uh, there's a V star on the right-hand side and no star. In yeah, the so, right yeah. Mm -hmm. so what I said a couple minutes ago was that star should be no star, or all of them should have a star. Sorry about that. Yeah. So um, even though what I just told you isn't a watertight uh, justification for why this will give the solution we're looking for, there's actually a proof, which we're not going to look in a lot of detail at, but it's kind of an interesting notion. Oh, can somebody close the door in the back? Um, it's a notion that if you apply the value iteration operation, and call it F, you have VI, you apply F, value iteration update, a Bellman update, you get VI plus 1, that that's actually a monotonic operation, meaning that if you have two choices for VI, you have two of them, you have VI and a UI, you apply the Bellman update. If VI was bigger than UI, then the updated version of VI will be bigger than the updated version of UI. Why? Because you sum it in and you sum in something bigger. Turns out you can use that property to show that this linear program as a solution has the unique uh, value function. This is more for your own kind of sake. Now, not expected to understand this in this like, very quick explanation, but at least you have the full story in the slides. Now I'm going to ask you an interesting question. How about this program? What if we um, turn it around? Instead of minimizing, we maximize. And instead of making v bigger than f of v, we say it has to be smaller than f of v. Now, you're not super familiar with this notation, so let's go back to this thing over here. Essentially, what we're saying is, instead of the min, we're going to max. And instead of having a bigger than here, we're going to put the smaller than there and see what happens. So it turns out that there's a way to make that work also. Um, it's just it's not a linear program, and so you cannot solve it efficiently. But it actually ends up, the proof that is worked through here, you can work through the same proof for the opposite direction, and it'll still show you that the, the only solution to this is V star. It's just not a linear program, and so it's not that useful, because linear programs we can solve efficiently, and general optimization problems is harder to solve. OK, again, that's mostly for your interest. Now what I do want to do is there's a dual version. So every optimization problem has a dual optimization. And the dual um, for the linear program is very intuitive. And we'll see it come back in the coming weeks when we do nonlinear optimization for control in different formats. So rather than deriving the dual um, by taking the Lagrangian of this program and then going through all the steps you do to get a, uh, a dual, we're going to just write it out and interpret it and realize that it makes a lot of sense.
Okay, so I'm just going to write it out and then we're going to interpret it. Max over lambda, often the dual variables are lambda, so we'll use lambda. Um, sum over S, sum over A, sum over S prime, lambda S A transition model, S A S prime, reward for this transition R S A S prime. So I'm going to maximize this quantity, which if you look at it carefully, you might already think of it as an expectation. Imagine lambda is a distribution over states and actions. It's not going to be exactly that, but it's going to be very close to that. Imagine lambda is a distribution over states and actions. Then what is this? This is the expected value when you sum over all states and actions of reward you would get from that state taking that action. Now this is kind of a weird sum, of course, because this would kind of assume that we're in each state um, with uniform probability. But the dynamics is not under our control. Also, the initial state might not be under our control. So now we need to account for the fact that somebody will give us an initial state distribution. And we will be later, the dynamics will control some of that. We don't have full control over that. So we add a constraint subject to for all S prime sum over A prime lambda S prime A prime is equal to. So think of this as if lambda is the probability of being in state S prime and taking action A prime, then this is summing out over A prime saying what's the probability of being in state S prime? I'm going to say the probability of being in state S prime has to be equal to mu 0, oh, I think I got a typo on the slides here. This should be S prime. Mu 0, S prime. So probability, so on the slide it has an S, this has to be S prime. Probability of being in state S prime when you start, because that definitely gives you probability of being there, plus discount factor gamma, because future things we care less about, it'll be reflected in this probability distribution, sum over S, sum over A, lambda, S, A, T, S, A, S prime. So this is saying, well, what's the probability if we start in S prime? And then this is saying, well, imagine we were somewhere else. What's our probability of landing in S prime? Because there's two ways to achieve S prime. We could have started there, we could have landed there. And if it's, so it's a self-consistent set of equations, because this has to be true for every S prime, I say here. That's this equation for every S prime. But all states are going to be S prime in this set of equations. And so it's a self-consistent set of equations, essentially saying the way the probability mass kind of is allocated is based on the initial distribution plus where you go from there. And the way this is defined recursively, this will actually account for infinitely many steps into the future where the probability mass has gone. In fact, if you say lambda S A equal sum T equals zero to infinity, gamma to the T, probability S T equal S, A T equal A. If that's how you define lambda S A, which is kind of the intuition we've been talking about, how much time do we spend in state S taking action A? But if we do it in the future, it counts for less. So it's really the discounted version of that. If you look at the discounted version of that and call that lambda SA, we'll see that this thing will satisfy this equation over here. And it's a self-consistent set of equations that actually allows you to solve for this thing over here. Because this gives you an equation value to solve for what these are, because you don't know what these are, because you don't know what your policy is. And only when your policy is set do you know what these are. And you actually have a lot of choices that satisfy this. And then the one that you want to pick is the one that maximizes reward. And so the key intuition here is this, this quantity here, that the meaning of the dual variable is the expected discounted 
amount of time spent in state as taking action A. And then it all makes sense. Expect the discount of time spent in state S taking action A times how much reward you collect every time you're there. That's the value under your current policy. We'll see a lot more equations like these in the future. Um, this is maybe one of the more complicated ones of its type um, because it's all in a stationary distribution as opposed to rolled out over time. Um, optimal policy, pi star, of S is equal to argmax over A lambda SA. So whichever action you take the most in state S um, is the one that's the optimal policy. In practice, unless there are some weird ties, um, there will only be one that has non-zero. All the other ones will have zero probability. You can just read out the one lambda SA for state S that has non-zero entry. Any questions about this? Because actually we'll see this come back, so it's good if this notation is clear because we'll see similar things in the future. Yes? Okay, so when you think about this thing over here, it's the expected discounted amount of time spent in state S taking action A. And you think about the dynamics of the world. For every policy, so think about any policy you could choose. There's so many policies out there. For every policy you could pick, there'll be a resulting lambda SA. So pick a policy, a lambda SA will result, right? Now, you could pick stochastic policy, you could pick deterministic policy, and so forth, but we can pick any policy we want, and we're still trying to find the best one, right? And we know that the best policy in a MDP, when there's no max int, well, it's, it's going to change. If, I mean, if we actually put a max int in the objective, it'd be different, but since there's no max int here, we know that the optimal policy is going to be deterministic, because one action will be better than the other actions, you should just take it, or maybe there's a couple that are tied for best, you should take one of those. And so that will show up when you run this optimization. Essentially, you're cycling in implicitly over all possible policies out there. Each policy implies a lambda SA. Rather than asking for the policy, you just say, I'm going to cycle over lambda SAs because there is a one to one correspondence between lambda SAs and policies. I'm going to directly find the lambda SA that maximizes expected value. And since we know the optimal policy, we know from our past work and valid tracing and so forth that the optimal policy is going to be deterministic or there exist optimal policies that are deterministic, the same thing will be true here. All right, let's take a couple minutes break here, and then after the break, we'll start with uh, continuous MDPs. Okay.
All right, let's uh, restart. So one question that came up during the break is, um, well, I'll just give the answer. I'll give it the, the two intuitions. One is, um, essentially, if you think about lambda SA, it's a probability distribution, but it's not normalized. The sum over A lambda SA for a specific S will not sum to 1. But whatever it sums to, that's your normalizing constant. And essentially, it tells you the conditional probability of A given S once you normalize by that. With that in mind, you can then also actually start thinking about entropy maximization. So you can actually, instead of having just the objective be expected rewards, you can add a term that's entropy. And now you have an optimization problem that is trying to find the lambda SAs that not just result in optimal reward, but also maximize entropy with some trade-off factor there. Yes? Is there a quantitative relationship between lambda SA and Q value for SA? Um, there is no direct relationship between lambda and Q in the sense that you can read one off the other. Um, even though they both have S and A as arguments, lambda SA is really a policy. And now, if you did the max n version, then you could probably take the log of the lambda essays and get back out the Q, Q values. But for the uh, regular version, essentially, it's going to be a deterministic solution, and the Q values will have kind of disappeared. So it's not clear how to get it back out. That said, if you solve a linear program, you do get the dual variables. The dual variables here will, I believe, be the Q values or the V values. I forget, depending on how many constraints there are exactly in this one. Yeah. Um, I mostly ask because it was the argmax A over this versus argmax A over Q values will still mm -hmm. be the optimal policy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in that sense there's a relationship, but it's not, you can't read one off from the other. OK, okay so now we're going to look at solving continuous MDPs with using discretization. Okay? So we're going to build on what we already covered to solve more difficult problems. Um, so we're still trying to solve MDP, so agent acting in the world, trying to collect as much reward as possible. Um, still same framework. We recapped at the beginning of lecture, so let's go through this fast. We saw um, value iteration already again. Um, we know how this works. But what if now we have a continuous state space? S is a continuous set. Value iteration becomes impractical. Um, because if you need to do for all states this update, when it's continuous, or maybe discrete and very large, but today we'll look at continuous. Um, that's infinitely many updates you need to do. And so even one iteration of value iteration will never finish. And so the question is, how do we deal with that? Um, well, what if we turn the original MDP, which is continuous, into a discrete MDP? Discretized version. So we have an original model, states and model over there, and then we put some bars above it to annotate that. This is not the real thing we want to solve anymore, but hopefully it's related and it's discrete. Well, one way we could do this is we could grid the state space. We could say, OK, it's continuous, but we just take some points on a grid, and we only look at those and define our MDP over those points instead of the original continuous space. We'd also need to reduce the action set, probably. If there's continuous actions, we also grid out the actions. Um, sometimes that's not needed. By the way, we'll see examples where you don't need to discretize the actions, even though you have to discretize the states. Why is that? Well, there's a max there, right? And so sometimes this max is an optimization problem that is an easy optimization where you just say, oh, max over A, but it's a continuous variable. Oh, I can put the gradient respect to A equal to 0. Maybe there's a closed form solution. And then I don't need to worry about discretizing actions. But in general, that will not have a closed form solution. And so then. To make it solvable, what we can do is discretize the action space, limiting our options, by the way. So some actions will not be available while we're trying to solve this. Um, sometimes something funny happens. Um, sometimes, even though you have a continuous action space available, you can prove ahead of time that only the extreme actions are going to matter. It's called bang-bang control. It's usually not that desirable necessarily to do bang-bang control because it's like very extreme, always maximal amplitude action one way or the other way. But for a lot of deterministic problems, bang-bang control is provably the optimal thing, according to you know, if the dynamics is really satisfied the way 
it's defined in your, your optimization problem. And so then you can just say, hey, I can choose between negative one and plus one, but I just only ever need negative one or plus one, never anything else. So I don't lose anything from discretizing the action space. The transition function is a tricky part, of course, right? Because um, think about discretizing states and actions, well, trivial, you're done, right? You just say, I only consider those states and actions, and you're good to go. How about the transition model? So what we're going to look at here is how we discretize the transition model, because that's the hard part. Then we'll look at look-ahead policies, some examples, some guarantees, and we'll connect with function approximation will be the topic of next lecture. So let me highlight the challenge here. So I think we've seen this equation for long enough now that I think we, we know it. So let's use this side of the board now to think through what happens when we discretize. So let's say we discretize. We used to have, actually I should erase better because I'm going to draw some dots on the board. Let's discretize our original rectangle, if that's our state space. We can say, well, that's too much, it's continuous, we can't deal with it. Um, well, how about we just say, this is possible, this is possible, maybe this is possible, this one's possible, this one, and this one. That's all we, we're going to iterate over. So just six states. Should be very fast to run value iteration now. OK, let's think about running value iteration. We're thinking about this state. We're going to look at the sum over all future states s prime. We we'll call our transition function. And it says, well, sometimes you end up over here. Sometimes you end up over here. Sometimes you end up over here. Well, how are we going to do backups now? Because we land in state as prime, but actually we're not running valuation over these states. We're only running a valuation over these states. But now we land in these other spots for which we don't have values, because our values are only available for those six states. What do we do now? Doesn't work. All right, can't do the backup. What we can do, if we really want to make a discrete MDP, we can say, well, you know what? This one is really closest to this one. So even though the model says I'm going to be here, I'm actually going to make this go here. So I'm going to effectively change my dynamics. I have a continuous dynamical system. It would put me in one place. We're going to actually say, actually, you'll end up over here. This one, maybe also here. This one, here. And so that way, we now can define a dynamics model. We now have our transition model, p of s prime given s comma a where this one here is s, um, well, we now know what it is. We have some good amount of probability ending up over here, some remaining probability ending up over there. This is for one action. Then for a new action, we can do the same thing and repeat. Now, the way I drew it here, it's more or less like a nearest neighbor type um, snapping to, to ones that we're willing to consider. That's one way to do it. There are other ways to do it. So nearest neighbor is very convenient because it's simple. If you look at continuous state, you just need to look at a certain level of uh, accuracy, and then you just round effectively, and that's your discrete state. Um, but the tricky thing with this nearest neighbor kind of snapping is that it doesn't reflect the dynamics all that well. For example, things could happen like this. Imagine you're here. And you go all the way here, and you get snapped back here. Or you go here, you get snapped back there. So essentially, whenever you stay relatively close to where you were, you get snapped back to where you started from. There's, like, there's no effect from your action. Even though, continually speaking, you are definitely moving. Um, but you didn't move, you got just snapped back. Um, similarly, if you say, well, if I want to move somewhere, let's say I want to get over here. In continuous space, I might have to apply a bunch of actions to get there. But in discrete, 
I can just say I apply minimal actions to just cross this boundary and I'll be snapped automatically here. Then next time I apply this action, just barely cross the boundary and I'll be snapped over here. And so there's all these things that you can exploit on the one hand by only going this far and getting snapped to where you want to be and also things that hold you back where you just get snapped back to where you started from. But in principle it's a valid approach. I mean the things I talked about if you make your grid finer and finer and finer the effects will become less and less and less. So with a fine enough grid it should work but intuitively it's, it's kind of not the behavior you hope for when you turn something continuous into something discrete. What can we do instead? What's a more natural thing to do? Well, more natural could be something where, let's say we still have the same set of states that we're willing to consider. Maybe we started here, and let's say we landed Actually, let's say we landed over here, this point. What would be a more natural thing to do maybe is to say, well, let's look at all the neighbors. I could, this point could really go here or here or here or back here because we didn't make it all the way to any of those other points. And we could say there's going to be a distribution over where we go. It has to sum to one. So we'll say some probability for each of those four. How much probability? Well. Um, you probably want something that's easy to compute, so you don't have to worry about much when you set up your discretization code, and you want it to probably be as evenly distributed as possible. Since there are four destinations here, and there's only one point in 2D, you only need three, actually. You only need three neighbors to be able to define that point as a weighted combination. Um, but we have four, so you actually have some flexibility. So you might say maybe maximum entropy is the way to do it. Maximum entropy distributed over all the neighboring points. I think that is probably the way to do it. I'm not 100% sure what the solution is to the maximum entropy problem here. If somebody can work it out, um, let me know. But I think maximum ent would make a lot of sense. Um, what is very convenient and might well be the maximum entropy solution, but I haven't proven it, but it looks like it could be, is to say, imagine I'm at a point s prime equals x comma y. This is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. I'm going to normalize things. So I'm going to assume this here is 1, this here is 0, this is 1. So you'd have to do some normalization work in your code to set this up, but intuitively this should be clear. And the grid points surrounding it, we'll call them this one I'll call psi, wrong Greek symbol, psi zero zero. I'll call this one psi zero one. I'll call this one psi one one and this one, psi 1, 0. Okay? Hopefully those are intuitive names. Then, if you want to say S prime should be a convex combination of the ones surrounding it, I'm going to say, well, how about how about S prime equal to 1 minus x times 1 minus y psi 0, 0 plus x times 1 minus x psi 0, 1 plus, oh, this should be 1 minus y here. Then 1 minus x times y psi 1, 0 plus x times y psi 1, 1. So first let's check things work out. So the sum of all these four coefficients is 1. Right? Um, 1 minus x times 1 minus y plus all the other ones sums up to 1. So we have a weighted combination of them. It's actually pretty high entropy, by the way, because the x and the y are treated independently. And 
Distributions with independent variables tend to have higher entropy. Um, then, if we look at it, psi 0, 0. We want this one to get a lot of weight when the point is close to here. Close to here means be close to 0, 0. Well, when you're close to 0, 0, this is close to 1, and you get a lot of weight. How about the next point, psi 0, 1? You want this to get a lot of weight when we're close to the 0, 1 coordinate. Well, is that correct? 0, 1, did I write it correctly? When we're close, we want this to be good when we're close to 0, 1 coordinate. So actually, we may need to flip this. Um, that means we need to flip the next one also. So we want this one to be high when we're close to 0, 1. 0 for x, so 1 minus x. 1 for y, so y here. This one we want to be high when x is close to 1, so we have x. And when y is close to 0, so 1 minus y. And same thing here, x and y, when close to 1, will be high. So now we get a nice stochastic transition model that distributes this next state mass onto states that are actually available in our value iteration. Any questions about this? Yes? So you're not stacking the state onto one of those, you're just distributing a probability mass? So we're, we're not snapping it to any single one. We're, we are still kind of snapping it, but stochastically, it could be any one of the four. So it's the transition model, the normal transition model is of the type P S prime given S comma A is given by your model, but this S prime will actually not be available and actually what you'll end up with is another model is in some sense P S double prime given S prime, which is gonna be the real state you're gonna be, the, the state you're gonna be using because S prime is not available in your indexing of states and so this extra transition is what's encoded in this model. So you go to your next state, but then there's an extra thing that happens to go to neighboring states that are actually available in your value iteration. So, we also have some slides doing the same kind of uh, drawings. So we already saw this, we already saw this, um, we saw this, though I have to go fix a typo there. Um, you can actually also do something else. So in what I described here, I said we're gonna take essentially the four states around us. Principle three is enough. In high dimensions, let's say k-dimensional space, k plus one is enough to surround your point. Um, and something called Kuhn triangulation exists that is a fairly efficient way to find uh, a triangulation, or it will be not triangles, but tetrahedrons and so forth in higher dimensional space that tell you how to interpolate uh, this way. And I have some, some slides here explaining how that works and there's some detailed math. Um, in practice, what it does, it introduces some asymmetries. Because once you do this kind of thing, well, why? Why should we in this case, why should S prime kind of be considered to be in this triangle versus there is a other diagonal we can draw in there? Why not use the other diagonal to generate the triangles and what happens then? And so it introduces an asymmetry that is not clear, but that's actually not, it might not be that great sometimes to have that asymmetry that gets introduced into your problem. Whereas if you use the rectangle, yes, you need to go to more points and so it's, your transition model will have more non-zero entries, but it's more symmetric and more reflective of what actually is happening in the real world, and so your solution might actually be better. There's some trade-offs here, because then essentially when you use this in high dimensions, k-dimensional, here you just have k plus one non-zero entries with the thing we're looking at. If you generalize this, you'll have two to the k non-zero entries, because a hypercube in k-dimensions is two to the k vertices. But ultimately, since you're cycling through number of discretization levels to the power k discrete states, two to the k should be a manageable number, because otherwise you couldn't manage the value iteration anyway. And so in practice, it should be fine to have two to the k that you go on to. 
and I'll keep it more symmetric. In my experience, it's also, it just works better, but that's, I mean, I don't have the world's most experience in this per se, but in everything I've done, keeping it symmetric tends to give better solutions. But I included the Kuhn triangulation so you know about it, not because I think you should use it, but because other people use it and you can be aware of it, that it exists. And there's a lot more about it here, um, how you can compute it. So, what's our status? We've seen two ways to turn a continuous state space MDP into a discrete state space MDP. When we solve it, we find policy and value function for the discrete states. They are optimal for the discrete MDP, but typically not for the original MDP, because we solved a new problem. We essentially changed the dynamics to be different from what they used to be. So the remaining questions are how to act when in a state that is not in the discrete state set. What's going to be your policy, because you have no policy available. And the other question is, how close to optimal are the obtained policies going to be and value functions? So, simplest way to act is to not use any look ahead at all. So what you can do is you can use the same kind of idea that we used for snapping or taking a stochastic mixture to look at what should happen in a specific state. We could say, well, just look at the neighboring states see which one is the closest and use the action that that state prescribes. Or if we do stochastic interpolation, we can say let's look at my neighboring states, let's see what kind of average I am of those neighboring states. If the action is continuous, I can just average the actions of my neighboring states and that's my new action. If the action is not continuous, averaging might not make sense, but I can take stochastic sample based on the weights I assign to each of the neighboring states. You can do more actually than that. What can you do more? You can actually do a look ahead. You can say, I'm not going to just uh, take the discrete policy and use it. I'm going to use the value function. I'm going to do one step look ahead. So the equation shown top left here says one step look ahead. I look at my action space, look at reward available plus, and you might want to discount depending on your problem, then the transition model here um, from the next state onto um, its discrete counterparts. So this is just a one step look ahead and it can actually give much better performance because now you can more carefully consider your action, see what the consequences are and take an action based on that. There's actually no reason you need to restrict it to looking one step ahead. You can look as many steps ahead as you want. You can say I'm going to look k steps ahead. So I'm going to see if I take this sequence of actions what is the sequence of rewards I get? At the end, I land in some state S prime, which might not be part of my discrete set, but I can still see it as a mixture of neighboring states that are in my discrete set and take the value from that mixture and say, okay, how good was this action sequence, both in terms of reward and future value? Now, how do you enumerate the action sequences? Sometimes there's a lot of options, so what are you going to do? Option one, you actually just enumerate them straight up. If there's a small number of actions at each time step, you might be able to do it for a short horizon. Let's say you only have two actions available. Horizon of 10, that's 2 to the 10. So 1,000 options you explore and you see which one's the best. It's feasible. Then, part of the beauty, by the way, when you do this is that for this entire sequence here, you're not discretizing anymore, right? No discretization. You're using the exact model that's available to you to forward simulate and it's only at the very end that you make an approximation. The value you use after, let's say, 10 time steps is the value if you were to be in the discretized version. But everything before that is precise. Now, to be fair, if your dynamics is stochastic, you won't just have a single rollout for an action sequence. You have to do multiple rollouts for a single action sequence to see what the range of possible futures is and average it. So it might start adding up. Another thing you can do is something called random shooting. You say, well, there's too many options, but I'm just going to randomly sample a few sequence of actions, evaluate this objective, see which one does the best, and take that sequence of actions. To be fair, by the way, you don't really take that sequence of actions. What you do is you have the sequence of actions, you take the first action in that sequence, and then you repeat this process. Because you'll be continually, for every decision, doing the look ahead to see what right now looks the best if you were to look, let's say, 10 steps ahead, topped off by an approximate value function at the end. You can also do something else. You can run an optimization. You say, that's an optimization problem. I can just run straight up optimization. We'll see some of that. 
Um, local gradient descent we'll see in future lectures. What I want to highlight in this lecture, one of the main concepts I want to get across is cross entropy method. So, um, cross entropy method is a way to maximize any function, f of x, over some vector value variable x, and f goes from rn to r. And the function f does not need to be differentiable, by the way. What's the idea in cross entropy method? Um, very, very simple. You start with a Gaussian distribution centered around zero. You sample from that distribution a vector, mu, that's going to be your new, um, your new mean. So that's your starting point. You have a mean as a starting point. Then you iterate. You're going to improve that mean. because It's going to be shifting that Gaussian distribution to a new mean, new mean, new mean, iteration after iteration after iteration. But where are you going to shift it? You want to shift it such that the mean is in the spot where the best x is. And then you can use that mean later as your solution. So once we have a mean, we iterate. We sample x's from a Gaussian with the current mean. Oh, indexing is off by, by one here, sorry. So you sample your x, a bunch, this first x, xe, from the Gaussian with the current mean. You compute the function value there, and you repeat. So there's a loop. You get a bunch of x's samples from your Gaussian, and you evaluate what the function value is. Then you say, well, where should I move my mean towards? Well, you just say, well, which were the x's that achieved the top 10% of function value? Whichever x is achieved top 10%, let's take just those x's, take the average of that, call that the new mean, and repeat. So pretty much the simplest thing to code up also. You have to code up something extremely simple only. You just have to sample from a, from a Gaussian, a bunch of x's, see which one are the best ones, top 10%, take the mean, repeat. It turns out that this will typically move the mean towards the position where you maximize f of x. It's a little uh, more subtle than that. It'll, try, it'll move the mean towards where, you know, under this kind of variance around the mean, you have the maximum expected value on f of x. But if your variance is relatively small, then essentially you find where f of x is the highest. There are a few generalizations of this. So the sigma and the 10% are hyperparameters. You can play with those. In principle, you can fit sigma to the top 10%, or even fit a full covariance matrix to the top 10% and use that in the next round. Um, how about discrete action space? As well, discrete, you can look at the top 10%, and let's, x is a vector. For the first entry in x, you can say, well, it's discrete. Maybe it's either heads or tails. You can see the fraction of times in the top 10% you have heads versus tails. And that fraction, you take that as your probability for it having to be heads or tails. And you do that for each entry. So you fit just a distribution to each entry of x. And then you can sample from that for your next round. Note, there are many variations. There's also max n versions of this, where instead of taking top 10%, you exponentiate all the f values, and then you have a you know, weighted sum based on the exponentiated f values. There's a lot of variations on this, but this is the main idea. And it's super, super simple. And pretty much any optimization you do, you should maybe first try this, because it's so easy to implement, so easy to run. And it might just work. What are some guarantees we can get? Oh, examples first. What are some examples of this? Um, here we have double integrator. This means essentially it's point mass in one dimension. So you can only move along the x-axis. It's using nearest neighbor, 30 dimensions per state. So one horizontal axis is x-coordinate, vertical axis is the velocity. And we see actually it takes a lot of iterations to get to a reasonable value function. But even so, the policy is not that great here. It's a one-step look-ahead policy. So you see it actually with this kind of nearest neighbor. Um, kind of gets reasonable behavior. goes towards the center, but not perfect. Far from with discussion 30. Here is what happens with the bilinear interpolation, the one I put on the board, where we take stochastic combination. After about 24 iterations, it fairly consistently starts moving towards the target. And after about 50 or so, it actually reaches the target consistently. Same discretization level, just a different way of making the dynamics discrete. 
The first one we watched was snapping onto the one nearest neighbor. The second one is stochastic distribution over all the neighbors. Mountain car. So let's take a look at this. Mountain car, um, rollouts on the right of the current policy, and on the left we see the um, current value function after two iterations. Again, nearest neighbor, and we have, um, actually, it might be 15. I said 20, but the plot looks like it's 15. 15 um, discretization levels, nearest neighbor. It actually doesn't really do all that well. Even if we get to, very far in, the value function is actually pretty bad. It just doesn't manage to propagate the values. Just like I said, you have weird effects when you snap to nearest neighbor. At 150, mountain car finally starts to work for nearest neighbor. Actually, a little sooner, but it's close to 150 when it finally starts to work and still needs a, a lot of iterations. So, and again, it doesn't propagate very naturally. And it's supposed to go to the top right there to the flag, and it's just not going there because just the way things propagate, this 2D problem, there's position and velocity, even all the way out here, it's just not doing that great. But at the very end, it does. It's just good enough to sometimes make it up to um, the top right. Um, here is, actually, here is 150. Um, if we look at the end here for 150 and over here, it actually starts getting there, again, somewhat consistently, but not that great. How about bilinear? We do bilinear, just as good of 20. It actually learns super fast. So just a few iterations in, you'll see things start to propagate very well. Much better propagation of values. Now, it's not far enough yet to actually have propagated to the bottom of this thing, which is in the you know, bottom left corner. But actually, there's already some things that have propagated, even though it, can't, it still looks very blue, and it's already making it after 30 iterations. So massive difference um, in terms of how well Signal propagates. We only have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to take questions after lecture. We compare um, if we compare what we get with nearest neighbor 20, nearest neighbor 150, nearest neighbor um, uh, linear, bilinear 20, we see much better um, results. We look all the way at the end. The bilinear just drastically outperforms the other ones in terms of getting a good value function out for this problem. This is what it's supposed to look like, and it actually gets it. OK, let's see. We have one minute left. Um, let's do the guarantees next time. In your homework, you're actually going to get to implement a lot of the things we just showed here on a variety of environments and study the effects of dis different discretization levels, look aheads, and so forth. See you on Tuesday.